<laughs> Good evening. My name is Yvi Sheyi. I'm the interim dean of the School of Library and Information Science. Uh, I want to welcome you uh, to tonight's event. We are deeply honored to have Roberta Schaefer <laughs> as our speaker tonight. Um, let me just say a few words about Roberta. We have been friends since 1990, oh. and I just feel so fortunate <laughs> to have her in my life. But, but let me tell you about all of her accomplishments. Oh my gosh. Roberta <laughs> is, is currently the Associate Librarian for Library Services at the Library of Congress. She manages 53 divisions and offices and oversees more than 2,000 people who are responsible for acquisition, cataloging, public services, preservation, services to the blind and the handicapped, as well as uh, network, network and uh, standards at the Library of Congress. Uh, Roberta has a degree, uh, B a, a degree from Boston College and graduated from Emory University with, uh, with distinction for her degree in library information science. And she also has a JD degree from the School of Law at Tulane University. She has a long and uh, has had a very distinguished career and has a lot of experience mm. in academics, management, librarianship, law, and technology. So she is perfect because she knows <laughs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just highlight a few pretty major achievements in her in her this uh, long and illustrative uh, uh, career. She was the Fulbright Senior Research Scholar at uh, Tel Aviv University at the uh, College of uh, the Faculty of Law, and she was also the Dean of Graduate School of Library Information Science at Texas, University of Texas at Austin. In addition, she was the Executive Director of Federal Library and Information Center Committee and Federal Library Network. And prior to this uh, current position, she was the Law Librarian of Congress. Uh, Roberta has a strong tie, a very strong tie to the School of Library Information Science. From 1990 to 1999, she was the coordinator for our Law Librarian Program. And in fact, I met Roberta in 1990, but I joined the school and we met at the very first New Student Orientation. And she gave a wonderful presentation of the law program there. I almost got, I almost decided to take that concentration. <laughs> <laughs> and so over the years, she really built up the reputation of that particular program and really put us on the map. So thank you very much for that effort. Okay. And that's why all these years we were we have been able to rest on our laurels, you know, <laughs> that, uh, and continue to be ranked number two in the nation uh, for that program. Um, Roberta, at that time, when she was the coordinator for our law program, she was also the director for research services at a major, major law firm in DC, and that is the uh, Covington and Berlin. It's still a very highly respected institution. Over the years, I have really learned, uh, have uh, known more about Roberta and really appreciate two of her quality I feel that I should highlight. One is that Roberta is very knowledgeable and, uh, and has a lot of experience, but the other thing is that she's very generous in sharing her expertise. It's not, she's not a hoarder, she's a sharer. And uh, I remember two years ago when I became the interim dean right away, I talked to her about you know, the contact and DC, and she said, no problem. So right away she was telling me, this is the, be sure to get in touch with this group, be sure to talk, to talk to that group. And I also uh, went with uh, Professor Roberta, I'm uh, sorry, Renata Chancellor to talk to Roberta at the Library of Congress at that time about our law program and, and how we can make it even better. And she was just extremely helpful in giving us all kinds of uh, tips and, and advice. In addition, another wonderful quality of Roberta is that she cares about our students. And she was a wonderful instructor, and every student just loved her classes. And one thing that I recently discovered was that I had a student who graduated about uh, 10 years ago, and she invited me to go to the DOJ, Department of uh, Justice, because they have a one elite program, and my student was selected to complete that program. And then, because it's such a special program, so when they finished that program, they had a special ceremony. And I was really honored that my student invited me, and then I saw Roberta. Then my student told me that, you know what, I've been kept keeping in touch with her, and she has been my mentor all these years. And just keep encouraging her and help the student to, to succeed and really blossom in at the Department of Justice. So thank you for all thank you've you. done for the oh, student. Thank you, Ingrid. Yeah. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming her, because oh. she clearly has a lot of Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're too kind.
Do I have to stay at the podium because of the camera? I think so. Oh, okay. That might be better because I feel rather distant from you. I know, I know I'm in an academic setting because nobody's in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is my, this is my uh, key to that. But good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And Dave Shoemaker, who's a good, uh, well, I don't want to say old colleague. That doesn't sound very good at all. A long-term colleague of mine as well. So I, I feel right at home, and I see many people in the audience with whom I have worked or have known for many, many years. So I don't really know that I'll be telling you anything <laughs> that's going to be earth-shattering or uh, new to you tonight. But anyway, we'll, we will see. I hope everybody has a copy of my talking points. The document looks like this. And I'll kind of go um, through them. What, what Ingrid didn't say very generously is that um, Yes, she gave my title correctly, but she didn't mention that I've had my job uh, for seven, well, six and a half weeks. <laughs> not, 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 of course, counting two federal holidays, which have to be extracted from, uh, from that. But it's really been quite an exciting time for me because really my whole life I thought of myself and defined myself as a law librarian. And my lens into every aspect of our profession was through the law, the lens of the law, legal information how this affected legal information and legal research and, and all of that. And the only subject matter that I don't have jurisdiction over in my new position is law. Because the law library, of course, is separately, is statutorily chartered at the Library of Congress. And so that is a freestanding law library of Congress within the greater Library of Congress. And uh, now it's kind of odd to look at everything and learn about music and genealogy and manuscripts and general collections and things that I actually have not thought about since I finished library school myself about 35 years ago. So hard to uh, give up the law because I love it so much, but then very exhilarating to be exposed to all the other disciplines with, with now such granularity. What's been particularly interesting this year is, and I have this at the top of the page, is this Carnegie challenge that coincides, in, an, in a sense, with my taking over this huge footprint at the Library of Congress. And so as many of you know, the Carnegie Corporation, which is the philanthropic sort of um, brainchild of Andrew Carnegie, is now celebrating its 100th year. This is the, one, the centenary of the Carnegie Corporation. And we, of course, there isn't really any aspect of um, librarianship or higher education that does not owe some debt to Andrew Carnegie and his really phenomenal, phenomenally philanthropic sort of perspective. And um, so in honor of themselves or to mark their 100th year, they have put out the Carnegie Challenge to all kinds of institutions across society. And you can read it, but what they're saying is you have to be able to say that you are doing real and permanent good in the world by responding to changing times by invigorating missions and adjusting focus, engaging in new and innovative methods of achieving goals, and serving as levers of change in measurable, sustainable, demonstrable, and reproducible ways. So it's a huge challenge, but when I read this, I thought, gee, this really is the kind of challenge that the Library of Congress needs to undertake, and probably every academic institution in America needs to undertake, because, gosh, we all know that that's a model that has not changed in a heck of a long time. Sitting in a lecture hall, having somebody talk to you, um, having a discipline as a major, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a tried and true model, which I think is being challenged. And then, taking the challenge a little bit further, our own profession. We need to begin to think, well, what, what are the things that we need to be doing that are going to make the huge contribution to society? And we really have a lot of things that we bring to the table uniquely that the world can use these days. So that's sort of the framework in which I began my um, tenure as the associate librarian with the Carnegie Challenge in front of mine. And then 
not only is it the centenary of the Carnegie Corporation, but there are some interesting other things happening in, in 2012 in terms of marking historical events. One of the most interesting ones to me is the um, passage of the Morrill Act. And um, Justin Morrill, who was the sort of driver behind that act, is also very, very close to the hearts of the people who work at the Library of Congress because he was a, was a senator uh, from Vermont, but he, along with the senator from Indiana, was the driver behind the money being allocated for our phenomenal Jefferson building to be built. And so we owe a lot to him on a very granular level or very personal level at the Library of Congress, but I think a lot of us owe Justin Morrill a huge debt because it was his idea to create the land grant colleges and universities across America at the time. And so it's the Morrill Act that created these. And it really took the model of higher education, the European model, and turned it upside down because it said that rather than the um, relationship between the faculty and the student, but rather the relationship that the student would have to a library for independent learning and to a laboratory for experimentation was really the model that fit this young nation that needed to sort of build itself and move itself out of the horrors of the Civil War. So um, it, it really created an innovation in higher education in America and set in motion really the whole um, history of higher ed in America. So that happened in 1862. And then um, our Library of Congress was started in 1800. And I can say this because I was the law librarian that law was really the genesis of the Library of Congress. So, you know, no disputing here. <laughs> and, and I think I can back it up because we actually know what was in that uh, law, that library, excuse me. And it was, for the most part, legal materials with a few dictionaries and uh, maps and gazetteers that would have been of interest to those very, very founding fathers, no mothers yet at all. And the Library of Congress really started as a law library because, again, we were um, birthed from really a bunch of people who were ready to innovate. They uh, embarked on this, I think they were shocked that they actually uh, became the bearers of a revolution. I think history tells us that they believed really that uh, King George would back down, that um, there wouldn't be taxation without representation, and everything would be good, and they would stay connected to the motherland, and we would you know, continue life that way. And so here, this, this revolution happens. They actually go ahead and win the war. Uh, you know, thank you to the French, who almost went bankrupt helping us. Uh, but nonetheless, here they are, and they're challenged to create a whole new government. They're challenged to invent this country that will be founded by um, tradesmen and middle class people who don't have uh, the trappings of royalty nor want it. And it's, it's a very interesting kind of dynamic. And they're kind of angry at the Anglo legal system because they think, well, maybe that isn't the best legal system. We have an opportunity to look at something else. So they go ahead and they have a lot of books in their library that are from the continental system. I mean, they owe this great debt to France. It's a great trading partner. Thomas Jefferson uh, makes it very clear that he's happy to travel back and forth any time they want him to. And Ben Franklin also had a blast in Paris. So, you know, <laughs> it might be nice to have a connection to this, this country rather than that country. So they collected books from all the legal systems to initially be able to pick and choose the way. And lots of people, I think, don't remember how much of a close call it was. Um, and many of the states at the time had origins in the continental system. So New York State, for instance, which was the biggest uh, financial center at the time, the, the, the um, financial exchange that the Dutch left was still in place and continues to this day the New York Stock Exchange. But of course, then it was the New Amsterdam Stock Exchange. 
Well, that had been the continental system. So there were lots of reasons to be attracted to this. Well, not to belabor the point, but you see, I hope, that law was the genesis of the Library of Congress. And we really went along as a law library until um, 1814, when it is um, reported that you know, the British purposefully burned the Capitol. And of course, the, the Library of Congress was in the Capitol. So most of the Library of Congress's books perished in that fire. Now, just as an aside, in 1814, we are going to be, we at the Library of Congress, so prepare yourselves, are going to be celebrating the War of 1812. Um, at, but we're doing it in 14 to not celebrate, but mark the, uh, war, the, the burning of the Capitol. And as you've all noticed, uh, because we've already passed the, the 1812 celebration, that there's still a lot of controversy about that war. And three countries claim to have won the war. <laughs> so um, as, as I've been reading more about the War of 1812, I'm just so amused that you know Canada won, we won, and Great Britain won that war. <laughs> so I guess those are, if you have to have war, those are the best kind, when everybody comes out thinking they are the victor. But, but nonetheless, because we were out of books and we were already getting used to needing research materials to, to govern the country, um, I think this is not disparaging to Thomas Jefferson to say that um, we went ahead and approached Thomas Jefferson, or we, is a very, uh, not a royal we in this case, but an American we, went down to Charlottesville to see if he would sell his book collection to America, because at the time he had the best private collection by far of anyone in uh, America. And that was because while he was in France, he was pursuing two passions, at least that we know of. <laughs> One was, um, of course, the passion to acquire books, and the other was the passion to acquire vines. And he was about to go into bankruptcy, about to declare bankruptcy. And apparently, some of the elder statesmen at the time went down to Charlottesville and said, you know, look, Tom, it's just, and this is my uh, script. It's not written <laughs> in his papers. But look, Tom, you know, you, uh, you really don't want to embarrass the country by going into bankruptcy. We've assessed your assets and um, your book collection and your vine collection uh, both have the same value. Which will it be? And I think this is a quote that we talk about all the time at the Library of Congress. Please take my books. <laughs> and I, I think that has a lot of innuendo involved. I think he really believed in his heart that it would be good for um, the, um, the American people and for Congress to have his phenomenal collection because the collection had perished in the fire. But I also believe that he was so committed to establishing the wine industry in Virginia <laughs> that he didn't want to see it be um, governmentized. And so he, uh, he went ahead and kept his vines. And, and we all know that he is, in addition to called you know, the father of the Library of Congress, he is considered the father of the Virginia wine industry. So um, he, he has a lot of other fatherhood things, and we won't go there tonight. <laughs> but the point being that at that time, because we acquired his materials, it kind of changed the, the, the Library of Congress. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes events that you won't anticipate, they can be true crossroads, and they can change your direction or have an enabling effect on you. And I think this is what happened in 1814 with the acquisition of the Jefferson Collection. Because he was such a Renaissance person himself, and because he collected universally, the Library of Congress then became the beneficiary of his scientific materials, his ph philosophical materials, his law collection, his own interest in foreign language and history. And there's a phrase we use at the Library of Congress, and I have to have the mnemonic device of MRI, which is a terrible thing, but it's um, memory, reason, and imagination. And these were sort of his hallmarks. And I think today those can be markers that definitely show a way or shed a light and may have good founding for the Carnegie Challenge in the 21st century. Um, you know, Carl Jung, whose papers we have, said that it's unfortunate 
but you really have to see the path to the future by looking at the horrors of the past and um, looking at the history of the past. You can't theoretically think about the future without knowing what was past. And so that clearly is the memory aspect. And then, of course, the idea that you have reason, that you can connect the dots, that you can see what one discipline, uh, the, excuse me, the impact one discipline has or the relationship that one discipline has to another discipline. And today, more than ever, our problems, this is, I guess, kind of like big science, our problems are so transdisciplinary, as are solutions. So Thomas Jefferson sort of understood that back in the uh, early 19th century. And then, of course, imagination. Only today, the buzzword for the eye is innovation. So we know that we as institutions, we as professions, we as academic places of learning, look to all of those three markers as we see what we can do to change ourselves to meet the kinds of things the Carnegie Challenge talks about. Well, not to take you totally through the history of the Library of Congress, but let me just bring up one final marker, which I think was pivotal to the institution and truly has sort of then given its direction for over 150 years. And that really was that in 1869, um, for the Copyright Act of 1870, it was determined that we would uh, be the depository for copyrighted material in America. And it's kind of interesting because if you look at what was coming through deposit at that time, it's vastly different than what would be coming through deposit through the 20th century or certainly through the 21st century. But um, I think the lion's share of material at that time was sheet music which always surprises people. But thank gosh that it was because we now have this phenomenal collection of sheet music at the Library of Congress. So we are really happy about that. It was you know, a penny uh, a sort of set or whatever. And people kind of thought of it as the, I guess, romance novels of the day, sort of trash. But we, we acquired it, we kept it. And today, it is an enormous resor resource for researchers. But um, that decision is um, something interesting for me historically because more stuff came in than we possibly had the shelf space for. And so that was the beginning of the discussion, which then took over uh, 20 years to get the Jefferson Building built. Because lo and behold, things were on the floor. And if you ever have the privilege, and it is a privilege, <coughs> of uh, getting a pass to go into the stacks of the Library of Congress, you will see that things are piled you know, this high on the floors today. We are out of space. And in fact, it is um, a challenge from the physical world that, that plagues us. We are beyond crisis stage, to be quite frank with you, on how to manage, not acquire, but manage the physical collections. So um, I suppose it's good that the predictions are telling us, but we're not seeing this statistically, that we will be able to sort of leave the physical world, not in the metaphysical sense, so don't worry, <laughs> but in the physical sense, in about 15 years, that we will have such a transfer of uh, format from the physical to the digital that maybe this problem is short-lived. But I'm not really sure. I don't see that happening quite as quickly and I don't see us finding intellectual property solutions quite as quickly as maybe we thought we would years ago. So we may still have this problem at the Library of Congress, but I am sure that Congress will not give us another building on Capitol Hill. So we will have to find another solution to that one. But in, in any event, you sort of, I hope, see where I'm trying to take you. And that is to pick a time in history where there were a confluence of events that really let, that were real game changers, that changed society in a profound and irreversible way. And I think the, um, the period from about 1870 to the turn into the 20th century was such a period. And I guess you all know and you all hear, everyone tells us, the futurists and everyone, that we are living in such a time today. 
But the question is, so what then is the future, or what does the future librarian and library look like if we really are at sort of in the perfect storm, if we're in a place of great change right now? And if you came here tonight to get the answer to that question, please leave now. <laughs> you can go home and you can have dinner. Uh-oh. <laughs> I already gave the secret away. <laughs> But nonetheless, what are, we, what are we trying to do in very sort of um, small ways at the Library of Congress? And I think it's important to say something about the institution here as well. That traditionally, the Library of Congress, because it feels the great weight of leadership within the world community, um, the responsibility to government and to the governors, and also to the entire library profession, it is not really want to be um, a, a huge risk-taking institution. So um, it's not, it hasn't really been known for that historically, but I think now more than ever with uh, the appropriations the way they are, there's even less of an incentive to do anything that has high risk. But by the same token, it's really impossible in our social, socioeconomic climate to not at least try to put yourself a little bit out there and do some things that are on the cutting edge. And so what we see at the institution now is this attempt to take small steps in the direction of risk, but modify the amount of risk in everything that's done. Some people who work at the Library of Congress basically pull their hair out and um, you know, want to go out and scream because of this approach. But in defense of it, I really think it's difficult when you have the kind of mantle that the library has on its shoulders to take too much risk. So you try to look at things that at least somebody has uh, engaged in. Someone is you, someone is test driven before you go out there. But there are things that um, we have a huge ability to be the lever, as the Carnegie Challenge says. And some of those are, for instance, to engage in protecting the values of a book culture. So to look at things, um, to, to put value on the idea of good and thorough information. And to be sure that you are not biased or partisan partisanizing information when you, when you dispense it. And this is a value that I think the institution takes incredibly seriously in its acquisitions as well as in the service it provides to all clientele. You know, that's our hallmark in service to Congress, but I think it pervades every clientele that the library serves. The other thing, and I think we have to be all engaged in this as librarians is the whole literacy challenge across society. And I'm not just talking about language literacy and the ability to read, although I think that that is really crucial to survival in today's society, but we have to have uh, some kind of interest as librarians and at the Library of Congress in mathematical literacy, and we have to have an interest in visual literacy. So there are all kinds of literacies today. And because information gets put in, the, in, in different kinds of packages, we have to make sure that we can facilitate everyone's access to it and that we also take as a personal value the importance of literacy to society. Now, it's very important, of course, to the economy. And Andrew Carnegie realized that. And I think, in great part, he was a phenomenal philanthropist, but in, in many ways, perhaps he was an even more shrewd industrialist, because he realized that these populations who were emigrating to America needed to have a certain level of literacy to be proficient, in, even in the um, factory floors and the places that they were being employed in. And that if they did not have that, that America, which was an emerging industrial power at that time, would never be able to be a sustainable, competitive, 
industrial power. So we go back to the Carnegie challenge, sustainability. So we're trying to take uh, a great part in data literacy now, in research literacy, and um, you are among the first people to know that we have just recently made a huge commitment to science literacy. So, and, and let me just fill that out for you a little bit, but we are going to be receiving the papers of Carl Sagan. So, uh, see, you're, you're all just admitted your age. <laughs> um, <laughs> millions and millions, yes, I can't, I can't reproduce his, uh, his voice. But um, his widow is uh, taking up sort of part two of the Cosmos series. And it is, I'll just give you this very interesting aside. The, um, Fox the Fox News Channel is looking to sort of appeal to a broader demographic than they currently <laughs> appeal to. You know what I mean. <laughs> and so uh, rather than uh, PBS or um, some other station, Discovery Channel, or whatever, take on this part two of Cosmos, she has decided to do business with Fox. And they will be the ones who, in the uh, January to June frame in 2014, they will be the ones who will be uh, broadcasting Cosmos part two. So petabytes and petabytes of millions of years ago. <laughs> And we're going to be working with them at the Library of Congress to do a science summit where we're going to bring together science teachers in the 6th through 14, so not six, eight, 6 years, but 6th grade to 14, so community college area, to talk about what are the sort of teaching innovations that we need to instill in kids going into middle, middle school, and particularly to instill in young women to pursue careers in science. But we at the Library of Congress are also interested in all kinds of citizenship literacies. So part of this program that we will start to work toward in the fall of 13, when the summit will take place, is looking at science literacy for the citizen. So the basic kinds of things that you need to know about science, not only to make good decisions in the um, voting booth or at the, on the ballot, but just in terms of your own life choices and your own priorities. How do you understand about energy challenges or health care challenges or even food additives or food regulation if you can't understand basic biological principles? And so we're interested in these kinds of literacies because we at the Library of Congress believe that we have to be a resource for every citizen. Now, not um, romance novels, not the basic thing that you can buy at the supermarket, but for serious research that anybody would want to undertake. And clearly, to get out of the practice of kind of calling ourselves a place for scholars. So it may be a nuance of a difference, but scholars have a kind of a reputation or they conjure up a certain image. And it is not the everyman that you conjure up when you hear the word scholar. And so we want to move the image that one has as who is the normal user of the Library of Congress and for whom the Library of Congress is an asset to the researcher, to the citizen, to the business person, to the parent, so that everybody feels that it is their library. And you know, we're doing this because we believe it, but we also feel that we need to do it, that we need to make the mission much more real for everybody. Because it's difficult for you at the ballot box to um, tell your representative or your senator <laughs> not to cut our budget, if you don't see our part in your life. So we need to sort of make it possible for you to see that we are an institution that serves you, the, the, the citizen, as well as the information professional. 
Now, you also know um, that one of the amazing things about the Library of Congress, and I think one of the unique things about it, if you want to frame it in terms of a national library, is that the majority of its materials, of course, are not America-centric. Now, you know, when you have 140 plus million items, saying that they're not America-centric doesn't really make America feel like she's a second-class citizen in the, um, in the, within the walls of the Library of Congress. So there is an amazing amount of material. But in the 1940s, and a little bit before then, the Library of Congress started to really be focused on acquiring materials from other countries and in other languages, to the point now where there's, I think, a statistical dispute at the Library of Congress whether we have materials in 147 or 246 non-English languages. And I think the dispute for the sort of 100 plus difference relates to whether you count some languages as dialects or some as bona fide, standalone, their own grammar, their own structure languages. But nonetheless, I think you get the point that we are not America-centric and we're not English-centric in what we're collecting. And again, this is a lever because we can, as an institution, acquire those materials. Being a government entity, having established relationships, even in countries that don't have a sophisticated information distribution channel, we can still be there and acquire these materials, and they can then become resources for the world, in addition to being resources for America. We're working on the new bibliographic framework. Um, those of you here who are in the, uh, in the auditorium tonight who are library school students, and how many of you are actually in library school? Okay. That's a nice number. So about, about half. You um, are sort of in a position that I was kind of in 35 plus years ago when I was in library school, and that is that there's a whole new system for um, organizing information that's coming down the pipe just as you're coming out of school. Mine was a little less daunting because when I was in library school, there was no such thing as AACR2. Nobody even thought to call what I was learning AACR1 because no one ever thought there would be a two or why would there be a two. But um, nonetheless, we're working at the Library of Congress on a new bibliographic framework. A way of describing objects of information that will allow them to connect more easily across formats and across disciplines and something that is really critical in today's society because you have to be opportunistic in the way you connect information. And I think that, in a sense, is sort of the underlying value of this whole big science movement. So we're doing that. We're also doing amazing things with the preservation of material. Um, you all read, I think, about this fabulous story in the Post, I think it's probably now six months ago, where it was discovered that uh, in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson had actually sort of blotted out his original term. He used subjects, and he realized, oh my god, you know, I'm not a subject anymore. I'm a citizen. And so through a new sort of spectrographic technology that we have, we were able to realize that he had made this edit. And that is really quite a, a sort of an insight into history. What were these people thinking and how were they defining themselves at this enormously uh, different time of their lives and, and, and what they expected their future to be like? What was their mindset? They had been subjects and now they're citizens. And has, does that, I'm sure it does, have application to people who are in revolutionary mode all over the world today? What's their mindset? How are they, how are they sort of describing themselves vis-a-vis -vis their government today? And what will be the change in mindset that they will need to think about if they are successful in their revolution? So it's a kind of a nice connection to Thomas Jefferson and what's happening all over the world today. 
We're also targeting our outreach much more, and that really goes to being less of a place for scholars and more of a place for good research. And then one of the things that I find the most exciting is our expanded acquisitions. So I think many of you probably heard, I guess it's about two years ago now, that um, Twitter is donating their archive to the Library of Congress. And it's been a, it's been a very slow ingestion. Um, not only because it's sort of humongous in terms of what you're taking in, but just all the issues with privacy and with um, who will have access to it, and then how will it be uh, managed in the tech technological sense at the Library of Congress. Just every aspect of it for us is kind of a new challenge. It's kind of what I was talking about before, going down a path with a certain amount of risk, but not opening ourselves up right away, first day of, of uh, the birth of social media, to social media. But it's really critical that the Library of Congress, that America's center of knowledge, be able to ingest this kinds of these kinds of materials because to even contemporary research, they are critical to be married to traditional materials in order to understand how things flow through the stream of commerce, through social streams, all kinds of things that are relevant to problem solving and decision making and being competitive. Uh, in, in, the, in an economic sense, and being socially viable in a, in a, in a socio-cultural sense. So we're doing that. We are also looking as the next step to bringing in social science data. So we're working with a variety of institutions trying to see how to bring in big sets of social science data. Thank goodness we're not thinking about all the pictures yet that the Hubble telescope is taking. Because that sort of you know, dwarfs any other big data challenge, every second millions of, of images. But if we can cut our teeth on some social science material, then maybe we can think in a few years about this humong these humongous sets of data that we'll need to bring in. And then we have been um, web archiving for quite a while, but we're kind of now at a point we have enough data collected that we'll be able to look at that and determine what's the future. And is this sort of sampling method that we've been using really going to cut the grass for the future generations? Just today, I got the green light to organize um, an e-deposit of copyright material committee. Uh, this is sort of a priority of mine in my first seven weeks on the job. And I think we need to be able to understand how to ingest it in a practical way, because everything's coming from a publisher in a different format with different protocols. And then also how to serve it. It'll have to be limited service, we know, because we haven't stepped over the copyright hill yet, but we will have to address those problems. And then last but not least, one thing that we are doing at, um, at the Library of Congress, and in a very guarded way, we're adopting this business practice that you've probably heard about or read about, which is, which is called the A to Z uh, sort of business practices. And the A stands for Amazon, and the Z stands for Zappos. And basically, what uh, corporations are doing as they enter the, um, the E space for transactions, they're trying to marker the best practices from both Amazon and Zappos that are kind of the leading innovators in this commercial space. Uh, a few years ago, I guess it was three years ago, I went out to Zappos, and um, they're right outside of Las Vegas. I cannot encourage you enough to uh, call them up. They run kind of one-day camps for people. You have to have an appointment. But any, they don't ask you why you're coming. It could be industrial espionage. I guess they don't care. And you can come and kind of spend the day going through each of their units, hearing about their philosophy. Now, I have to tell you that it was not an easy um, feat to convince the person who signs off on my travel at the Library of Congress <laughs> that I needed to go to Las Vegas, Nevada, to spend a day at what he thought of as a shoe warehouse. <laughs> and
And I said, oh, no, 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 you're all wrong. First of all, the warehouse is in Lexington, Kentucky. So you don't have to worry about that. But the call center, of course, is right outside of Las Vegas. But it really is a fascinating kind of business practice that Zappos uses, which, which if I could distill it down, just in case you can't get out to Las Vegas in the near future, is to empower the person who is providing the service. And to have guidelines, but not to template or script the entire relationship. And um, when I was out there, all I kept thinking, my cartoon balloon was, gosh, Tony Shea thinks he invented this. This is the reference interview. <laughs> but we have to keep that in mind every time we do something. And so many businesses that are involved in um, online sales or catalog sales have a highly scripted kind of a relationship with the customer. And many of them fail. But Zappos, which has a totally free form, it's, it's what they told us that day is there is basically very little that's off the table for the person you are talking with. And I'm telling you this because you might be able to use it someday. There is very little that they can't negotiate with you on the spot. So they are empowered right at the front, right in the trench. And they told us some amazing stories about that. One of the interesting things, uh, they, they run you in cohorts of eight people. One of, I had never, I, I'm a shopaholic, I mean, I admit it readily, and I, I love shoes, but I have a very odd foot. I have like the narrowest foot. When I was a little girl, my father used to say I had gondola feet. Um, so I never thought about buying shoes online, and I always assumed from everything I'd heard about Zappos that they must be a discounter. They must discount shoes because so many of my friends, men and women, loved them so much. I thought, oh, you know, you must get designer shoes at half price. They're not a discounter at all. Yet they have a 99% return rate. They have phenomenal, enviable customer loyalty. It all has to do with customer service. So people don't go there for the bargain shoes. They're not getting bargain shoes. They're paying full price. But they go there for the customer service. So A to Z, we're trying at the Library of Congress, in our interactions with our customers, and we have many, many strata of customers, to implement A to Z customer kinds of services. And I think that's something that we can all think about in our everyday life. So when you hear that or read about that in the Harvard Business Review, you'll know what that means. So the, the final place that I want to go on my handout is really just to point out to you um, these sort of drivers that impact future initiatives. And I promise you, I'm not going to fill my time by reading them to you. But what we're trying to do within my unit is develop what we're calling a kind of information coral reef. So as people see social or economic trends that they think will have an impact on society. We're capturing them in this coral reef. They are very disparate in, in, their, in their singularity, but when you put them together, they kind of begin to make a reef or make a form that can have relevance. And so I want to point these out to you and ask you if you read them, if you agree with them, please let me know. My information is on the back of the handout. But I'm going to deputize you as an ambassador tonight and ask you that if you see trends or you're aware of trends that you think will help the Library of Congress address the Carnegie challenge, I would love to hear from you. And you're probably like most people in the information professions you probably have a very uh, eclectic kind of a background, rather eclectic interests. You might be a little eclectic yourself. And um, it would be very good to hear from you and get your perspectives. But we're trying to do this in preparation for undergoing a kind of, we're, not, we're looking for the right term. We would have called it five years ago a strategic plan. But we think that that's a little bit passe, first of all, because 
In the corporate sector, as you know, that the whole five-year thing that we probably got from the military, if not the Chinese, uh, uh, the, Red, the Red Army, uh, is, is kind of passe. You have to be able to show in 900 days complete revolutions now in organizations. If you can't do 900-day revolutions, you can't survive in this economy. So five years are out, 900 days, might be a little tough in the government, but we're going to try to find a way to sort of be able to reinvent ourselves or at least be reactive to things much more quickly than we ever have. And um, maybe part of that is implementing A to Z and empowering people much more at the front line than up the chain as much as we have in the past. So um, I will leave you with the, with the drivers and then I'll just tell you a little bit, bit about the Wordle on the back. I told um, Ingrid that I, didn't, I haven't done PowerPoint in several years. I'll tell you why. I love, when PowerPoint first came out, I mean, I thought it was the coolest thing, you know. I just, I kind of like, it was love at first PowerPoint presentation. And um, I guess about seven or eight years ago, we were refinancing our house, and I wanted to show my husband sort of like some comparative things. And at breakfast, I pulled out my laptop, put it on the table, and I said, honey, I just want to show you something about the, uh, about the, about the refinancing. And I had this interest rate floating in and floating out. And then I scrolled up to 10 years from now at a 15 year, and 20 years from now at a 30 year, and had everything come together at the end. And then I had, for further information, contact. <laughs> with colors and, you know, all kinds of bells and whistles. And um, he said, you know, I think you have totally gone crazy. <laughs> and I said, oh, but it's so much fun, you know. So I, he kind of sort of started to sensitize me to maybe I should keep PowerPoint to myself. <laughs> so I, I have then, I've started doing talking points. But I think you do need um, a succinct way when you've had a conversation, one way tonight, but we'll change that in about one minute, I think you need to find a way to um, sort of summarize everything. And so I have also totally given up on this executive summary concept that was like the thing in the 90s because every executive summary I ever wrote was like the same thing I said in the 50-page report, only, you know, I said it in 10 pages and like the person who was receiving it really wanted to read 10 pages. So I started using Wordles and I absolutely love them as you can see. So the back page is simply a wordle of everything that's in the middle pages. And um, I think you can kind of visually pick out the, the things that I, I felt are important, particularly because so much of this talking points document is the drivers. You can get the driver words from the wordle. So that's the back, as well as my contact information for anything you could ever want to contact me for, but hopefully to share some of your drivers with me. So with that, I'll stop. And um, I'd love to hear from you questions or comments or anything you would, would like to say. So thank you very much. <laughs> anything? What do you think the drivers are? Oh, gosh. Well, that's, that's a, a kind of a hard question to answer because um, the lady who's asking the question knows that the law library uh, and being the law librarian of Congress was literally my life dream. Oh, and Betsy knows, and <laughs> Joan knows, and Cameron knows, so, and Larry knows. <laughs> um, and, and I had set my entire um, sort of career. You, know, you, you can have a successful career, I think, in two ways. You can either be prepared and opportunistic and something comes your way and you take that or you can be like I was and planned where I wanted to be in X number of years and then took positions or evaluated learning opportunities based on how they would prepare me for that job. But 
for at least 25 years, anybody who asked me, I would always say my career goal is to be the law librarian of Congress. And um, I, I really loved being the law librarian of Congress. And in fact, uh, my former boss at Covington and Burling called me about um, a month after I was the law librarian. And he said, you know, you might think it's odd that I haven't congratulated you. <laughs> And he said, I, I didn't really know how to do that because I knew that this was your life dream. And I was so concerned because sometimes when people have such a singular goal and they get there, and I don't know if being the dean of an iSchool was your, <laughs> uh, then it's a disappointment. And frankly, you know, a month on the job, it had been like such a frantic time, wonderful, but uh, very frantic. And so I said, you know, I hadn't really stopped to think about that, except that I do know it's even better than I dreamed it would be. And so what basically happened was, you all know of the phenomenal Deanna Markham. She was the dean of this school, uh, I guess, in the uh, early 1990s. She decided to retire. And um, there just really was not anybody internally who could take her position. One of the flaws, I think, of our institution, of the Library of Congress, is that we are an incredibly complex organism. And it is very difficult for someone to come in from the outside into um, a position that is higher than a certain level. So it's fabulous to start your career there. Many people do, and then they will not leave. And they have incredibly rich careers. But if you are coming from the outside, no matter how accomplished you have been, it's very difficult to navigate the ship. It's, it's a hard organization. And so I think the feeling is that you want to grow your talent inside so that when you have high-level management vacancies, you can put people in there who understand the organism. It's complexity its quirks, of which there are a number, and then its culture, which every institution is unique, so that they can be successful pretty quickly. So there really wasn't anyone who was apparent to fill right in. It's funny because the very next line has an enormous amount of talent in it. And so I really feel like I could retire in about three years and not worry at all. But at this particular juncture, there wasn't anybody. And one of your graduates was, or was my deputy at the law library, David Mao. And I think Dr. Billington looked around and he said, well, I could move Roberta to Deanna's position because I don't have to worry about the law library. Not because I think she'd be great in Deanna's position, but because the law library would be covered. And David Mao followed me as the law librarian, as the 23rd law librarian. So I think it was really just a matter of looking for somebody who kind of knew the structure, kind of knew how to, how to navigate things. And I was, in a sense, one of the few people standing who could do that. I'm not taking offense at it at all. Uh, I love the job. It is really fabulous. And the staff has been amazingly patient with uh, all the things that I don't know yet. I've been working very hard, studying every night. I have a satchel here filled with homework. Every night I go home with homework. I read on the metro all the time. I've missed my stop twice. <laughs> it's that interesting. But um, it really was just being sort of there. Uh, it was, there's a, an aspect of federal government at a certain level, which is in the executive branch called the SES, and in our branch, senior level service, SLS, in the ledge branch. And you can be moved around by the head of the agency as deployment requires. And so basically within sort of over, over a weekend, I changed my, uh, <laughs> my, my, my life. But I'm so glad that I was the law librarian for two and a half years. And, um, and I'm ready for the new challenge. <laughs> yes. Well, 
Well, you know, I think, Marianne, that we're doing a few things that are kind of interesting. Now, we, are not, we have not rolled this out yet, but we are thinking about following the Google practice, you know, the 80-20, which Google is so famous for, where you do, um, you have uh, four days a week of your job, you're doing your job, you're in your position description, and then the other, the, the other day or the other 20%, you're doing something that's a kind of a reach or unrelated to your normal function. We are um, highly unionized, which is a great thing. The unions are wonderful at the Library of Congress, but this kind of a thing has to be carefully negotiated. But we are seriously looking at the, using the Google innovation in, uh, in the Library of Congress. And then a lot more job sharing. So we were just talking about this today. Um, and by job sharing, we don't mean in the traditional way where you and I share one job, but where somebody literally has a home department or a home base, and it has to be the majority. So it would either be 60 or 70% of their job. And then they do something else. It might even be related for the other 40 or 30% of the job. So we're, we're looking at those kinds of models. Fortunately, they are, again, since we're not risk taking, they are out there in the marketplace quite a bit. And so we can look at the uh, best practices and see how we can bring them into the government sector. But that's one example, or two, in a way. Yeah. Yes. I think it will continue to be a leader, but I don't think it will be uh, sort of our way and then you all go out there and adopt and adapt it to the way you need to use it. I think we will be much more of a leading collaborator, trying to look at innovating practices that can be used immediately by others in the community so that we can have interoperability immediately. Because we are more, it's always been that we have provided, I think, great service to the world library community. And it's kind of been able to sort of be, this is how we do it, and we're, we'll, we'll share it with you, but we're not really part of the need to share it with you. We don't benefit trickling up. I think we are looking more and more at collaborating and therefore it will behoove us to be much more concerned as we develop standards and as we implement practices and workflows to understand how it will impact workflows and practices for all kinds of libraries around the world because we will want to be able to instantly collaborate either on the what used to be the traditional technical services side or possibly even on the acquisition side. And if we don't do that at the beginning, it's so much harder to then fit it all together down the road than it would have been if we actually planned it that way from the beginning. So that is a different mindset for us, for sure. Yes? The A to Z? <laughs> Right. Well, going to this low risk, you know, sort of small steps, we're trying to use it now in the web design arena. But the idea is that it would then roll out across the institution. And yes, you're right, the hospitality industry really um, reinvented itself with this concept of empowering people at the very beginning levels. It's kind of interesting also because we're doing a little bit of um, other marking with the Carnegie Challenge with the hospitality industry because um, they have totally, in the last 20 years, kind of changed their whole focus. And, and walk with me for a minute down this path. They used to be 
uh, looking to provide an experience for you, the lodger, whether you were a tourist or business person, that would not be like home. It would be um, sort of a different experience. You would leave home and you would go to a hotel and you'd have a different experience. And over the course of the last 20 years, what has happened in the hospitality industry is that people travel and they want that hotel and hotel room to be as much like home as possible. <coughs> they want it to have the look and feel of their own bedroom. They want to have access to the technology and the entertainment that they have at home. They want the toiletries in the bathroom to be those very toiletries that are their demographics preference toiletries. They don't want to try the upper end. They don't want to try something that is, you know, out of their financial reach. They want what they're using at home in the bathroom. It has to be as much like home. So that industry has really reinvented itself with this kind of a philosophy, the Carnegie Challenge. Maybe they're not contributing to world good. I don't want to say that they're not, but maybe they're not. But they have basically taken their mission, reacted to drivers, and changed the whole experience for the lodger. Anything? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I see us as having a, a bigger and bigger portfolio and impact than we have ever had. And I appreciate the fact that you are calling us the information professional. I do that myself. But I actually want to say that I don't think we should at all be embarrassed or afraid of the L word. <laughs> because I think that it has enormous gravitas socially. And I always think about the fact that, remember 10 years ago, Credit unions were thinking of changing their names to banks. And you know, they gave up their whole, they would have given up their whole reputation. And they would have joined, you know, a bunch of thieves. And, um, <laughs> and it really would have been a terrible change in nomenclature for them. So I think when we think about changing a profession's name or even a professional association sort of changing its name, you have to be really careful uh, to do the, the cost-benefit analysis or the SWOT grid and make sure that you might not be giving up more than you would be gaining. And there are such good connotations to library, to the, you know, the purity of information, the nonpartisan aspect of it, the comprehensiveness of it, all those connotations that the word library and the professional label carries that will only have more and more importance as uh, the information, as information integrity is challenged, as privacy issues are, are challenged, as information overload becomes more and more difficult to deal with because decisions need to be made quickly, yet the information is, is, is enormous. So I think we need to be careful. There's nothing wrong with the label information professional, but I don't think we ever want to be afraid that the library word, the L word, is going to lose its gravitas, its connotation, at least not in the next 20 years. You gave me a nice frame because at the Library of Congress, we are trained to think in 100-year kinds of ways. What are they going, we have to acquire today, somehow, you know, tele, tele, telepathically, what are they going to need in 100 years? But the interesting thing about that is, every day when I go to the stacks to look something up, I'm so sure it won't be there, because it would have had to have been acquired in like, you know, 1841, and it's right there waiting for me on the shelf. So I only hope every day, after I walk into the stacks, with the glass half empty and leave with the glass half full, I only hope that somehow osmotically I'm getting what they knew. But 20 years, I think we're fine. So, you know, you, you kind of look like a crowd that 
will work for another 20 years or so. <laughs> I, th I think there's a lot of job security in this room. <laughs> that's why I go back to find that article, or that's why I go back to find something. And so in 50 years, when researchers are looking about how we organize our professional information, I bet it's going to be one of the things they say. Yeah, well, thank you for that. But yeah, that, that's a huge driver today, huge. Well, I think you were a fabulous bunch of colleagues. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.